God bless you and greetings to you in the name of Jesus Christ. My name is Gary Tyson, and today we're going to talk about joy. And the uh, screen before you is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, Proverbs 25, verse 2, which says, It's the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it's the glory of kings to search things out. And I believe there are some things in the Bible that are right on the surface, such as, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. I mean, that is right as you read it, you know, the truth of the situation. But I believe even under a statement like that, there's layer upon layer of complexity and intricacy and amazingness that God has placed there for us to learn more about. And so there's many things about the Bible that we think we know that we really don't know the depth of, have really no idea about the depth of. And there's plenty of things about the Bible we have no clue about. And so I believe it's been God's uh, prerogative to make things a little more difficult for us to find, but it's, but it's our joy and glory to get in there and dig in God's word to find the depth of the meanings of some of the things that he has placed in front of us. And uh, we're going to talk today about a certain topic, a certain aspect of joy, of which we're barely going to scratch the surface. And so I'm going to give you some perspective on joy that perhaps we've not seen before as Westerners, uh, but I'm by no means going to give you the whole complete topic. We are, again, are just going to scratch the surface, and there's much more to dig and to find out about in God's Word. Uh, this is one of my second favorite verses in the Bible, and this is the key to digging in God's Word. And this is uh, Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, and it says, I am God, and there is no other. So that's a comfort to know. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. And the amazing thing about this verse is we can see what God set up in the beginning of time and some of the stories and the prophecies and the uh, concepts of the Old Testament. And we can project forward not only to the time of Jesus, but the time we live in now and then into future times to see what God's plans and purposes are, especially for us. And I like to say that uh, the Bible is... The history of the Bible, you know, the stories of old, are really prophetic pictures of that which is to come, and the prophecy of the Old Testament and New Testament as well are pictures of that which is going to be history in the future. And so there's much to learn in the Old Testament about what is going to happen in the future. And there's many pictures in the Bible that we can glean God's plans and purposes from uh, if we only look deeper. And again, it's God's hiding things and us having the, the joy of digging things out. So we can look back to the beginning and see things about the end. But the other thing is we can see things that are going on around us now, which is toward the end of the story, and then project back as to what may have been in the beginning, you know, concepts we're not clear about uh, that were from the beginning of God's story. And so it goes both ways. But this is a wonderful verse to show that God has given us clues along the way of what's going to take place in the future. Well, this is the verse that this whole teaching got started with. This is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And uh, it's, it's always been another favorite verse of mine. But it's one that kind of spurred me to think deeper about the subject of joy. And in the, in the Hebrews 12, 2 says this, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the leader and finisher of our trust, or our faith, same word, who, because of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, thinking nothing of the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus, obviously, his life was filled with trials and temptations and really very stressful things, especially the last few days of his life were you know, huge turmoils. Uh, but it says that it was the joy that he saw in the future that allowed him to endure all the things that he endured. And so it got me to thinking, how big must that joy have been? The joy that got him through not only his entire earthly life and all the trials and tribulations that that, that brought, but also those intense last few days, uh, the false accusations that were brought up against him, the kangaroo court 
uh, not only before the Sanhedrin, but before um, Pilate as well. The beatings, which we know was more than just a few minutes here and there, the beatings that lasted for hours, uh, the unbelievable pain and the humiliation of crucifixion. The Romans chose crucifixion as a form of punishment because it was very humiliating. It was, uh, you know, extremely painful. It lasted hours or even days to die on a cross. It was very humiliating, and, and it was done very much in public. Uh, people were crucified along major thoroughfares so that other people would see those poor people, you know, hanging there and would realize that they would never want to break the Roman laws because that was the outcome if you did. And so the crucifixion was extremely painful and very humiliating. And so the joy had to get him through all those things, especially when he knew he was completely innocent of all the charges. And not only that, his accusers were not innocent of many of those charges that he was brought up against. And so it had to be an amazing uh, joy that he had to get him through all that. And it didn't, I didn't realize it until the moment I began to look at this much more deeply that the picture of the joy that I always thought Jesus had and the joy he probably really did have were two very different things. So when I, th when I think of how I always thought of the joy that he had hanging on the cross, it was uh, interesting. So when I think about the joy he had on the cross, I always thought, well, he saw me in the future with him. And there's a there's a verse in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 52 and 53 are a very interesting picture of his crucifixion. And there's a part in there, this is Isaiah 53:10, the second half of verse 10. It talks about he will see his seed. Now, he didn't see his seed when he was crucified, but it's referring to the future when we are going to be there with him uh, in the future kingdom. And so I always thought, well, you know, part of the joy he had was he was going to be with me. You know, that's a good thing, right? Uh, he went to prepare a place for me. Part of the joy, the picture of joy I always saw he had or thought he had was the fact that in John 14, he told his disciples, and by way of, you know, association, us, that he was going to go and prepare a place for us. And so that, that would be very joyful, I thought. And then finally, he knew he was paying the price for my sin. He knew he was accomplishing my salvation. And uh, in Romans 10, verses, uh, in verse 9, it says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you make Jesus your, you know, the boss of your life, and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, it says you will be made whole. Now, our salvation is in part now, uh, you know, we've been made whole spiritually, but physically and mentally, we've not been so much made whole. Uh, but in the future, we're going to have new bodies, we're going to live in a life that, you know, in a world that doesn't have pain and suffering and all that, you know, the, th the new heaven and earth, eventually. And so we will have complete salvation then. So our salvation is in part now, but it will be complete in the future. And so I thought, well, those are all things that would, you know, bring Jesus joy. I mean, being with me, I mean, that's a great joy, isn't it? And so then I thought, well, you know what? That's probably not the whole picture. Because clearly the picture of the joy I thought Jesus had was pretty self-centered. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, yeah, I'm probably not that great a, you know, person to hang around with. Uh, but I realized that the picture of joy that I had that got him through his trials and temptations was probably a world apart from the joy that he had that got him through his trials and temptations. And furthermore, I realized the picture of joy that I had was sort of vague and fuzzy. And if you have a concept of something that's vague and fuzzy, you probably don't have a pretty good concept of it. And so the joy, the picture of joy that I had in my life was barely enough to get me through the, the plain and boring trials of my life. And I thought, nah, that's certainly not going to be enough to get him through crucifixion and all the horrible things that he went through. So I realized that the picture of joy that Jesus must have had to get him through all those things must have been very clear, must have been very detailed, and must have been very big. And so I began to think, well, what exactly was the picture of joy that Jesus had? What was the source of the joy that Jesus had? And so did he have a bigger context for joy? Was there something in his life that was a much clearer, bigger picture of joy than what I realized? Uh, did he see an already long-standing picture given by God that puts joy in a bigger, deeper perspective? So was there something in his life, some, something in his culture 
that painted a much bigger picture of joy than we realized or that I realized. And, and I thought, well, what if he had a different mindset of joy? Uh, what if he had a picture of true joy that would have been much different than my picture? And what if his upbringing, his cultural standard, his way of understanding was much different than mine? What if he saw real joy? What if there was a, a picture of real joy that he could refer to, that he could go back to in his mind when he was hanging there on that cross? And in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, it says there's a season for all things. Now, if there's a season for all things, then there must be a season for everything. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, in the first few verses, it says, for everything, there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest what is planted. And so I began to think, if there's a season for all things, is there a season for joy? If Jesus had a picture of joy, could there, be, could there have been a cultural uh, reference in his life that would have been a season of joy, a time, a real time for joy that the Jewish people knew about? And so then I just was very happy to discover that there was a feast of the Lord, a feast of Yahweh, that is called the season of our joy. So one of the feast days of the seven main feasts given in the Old Testament that the, the Jewish people were to celebrate, one of the feasts, and that's the Feast of Tabernacles, is actually called the season of our joy. And that didn't take me too long to say, hmm, I wonder if there's a relationship here between the season of our joy and the joy that Jesus had to get him through his trials and temptations. So I began to dig into it, and here's what I began to ask myself, is that what if the joy that Jesus held in his mind during this time of suffering was the joy that is described and really rehearsed in the Feast of Tabernacles? And what if, the, what if Tabernacles was a celebration that even as a boy he looked forward to, that they went up to Jerusalem for? and that he did every year of his life? What if he already had a yearly perspective of joy that was built into his culture and he celebrated with his family every single year? And what if this feast, furthermore, was the actual picture of the joy of the millennial kingdom? So not only did Jesus have joy, but it was a joy that he was actually seeing forward even while he was hanging in the cross. He was looking forward to when that joy would be fulfilled. And what if this appointed time, so remember the festivals of the Lord, as we talked about before, are dress rehearsals. They're appointed times. They were seasons given by God to paint very detailed pictures about a future event. And what if this was the dress rehearsal of the future kingdom coming in the millennial kingdom? So just as a brief review now, uh, I'm going to just quickly uh, talk about the, the, the seven feasts. And as we saw before, and if you want to get a much more detailed picture of this, uh, last time we talked about the feast in much more detail, so I refer you to the video that we recorded earlier. Uh, but just as a very thumbnail sketch, there's seven feasts uh, given in the Old Testament, and this is in Levit uh, Numbers, Leviticus, and Exodus. Uh, the first four are the spring feasts, and they were a picture of the Messiah's first coming. So Passover was freedom from slavery, not only from the children of leaving uh, Egypt in the Old Testament, but also Jesus and his death and, uh, was the uh, price for sin so that we would be freed from the slavery of, of evil and the, uh, of Satan in this world. Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Jesus was in the ground during the Feast of Unle Unleavened Bread, and Unleavened Bread is a picture of sin cleansed uh, from our lives. Uh, he got up on the Feast of First Fruits, was a, which is a picture of resurrection and harvest and uh, being made right with God again. And certainly he did that with his resurrection uh, on this particular spring festival. And then 50 days after that was the Feast of Pentecost when the church began, when they were all gathered in the temple. Uh, they had saw the tongues of fire, heard the mighty rushing wind. Those were all pictures of Pentecost, which, were, which was to celebrate not only the wheat harvest, but gifts from heaven, which would have been the wheat harvest 
Also was a picture of the Torah given in the Old Testament when God's word was given, you know, given to Moses uh, on Mount Sinai. And on the Feast of Pentecost, when the church began, the gift from heaven then was Holy Spirit. So these were feasts given by God, and they were pictures of future events that were eventually fulfilled uh, in, in Jesus' first coming. But then we have three fall feasts that nothing has happened yet on these to uh, give us a bigger fulfillment. And those are the pictures of the Messiah's second coming. And so Rosh Hashanah and some future Rosh Hashanah, I believe that Jesus Christ is going to come back. Rosh Hashanah is all about awakening from the dead. It's all about resurrection. It's all about uh, the uh, uh, coronation of the king, very much uh, trumpet blowing, very much pictures of the uh, coming resurrection when Jesus comes back for the church. Uh, Yom Kippur is a feast all about mourning and atonement, uh, and it's a picture of Jesus coming back uh, during the end of the book of tri- uh, the book uh, or the uh, time of tribulation on earth and then tabernacles after yom kippur is a feast that's all about joy it's a it's the fall harvest when the fruit harvest was uh harvest of the grapes harvest of the fruits um and that it was all about celebration it was the uh all about joy and rejoicing and i believe it's the picture of the start of the millennial kingdom sometime in the future so we're going to see, uh, as we look at tabernacles more, that this, this pattern of joy, this season of joy, is really the picture that Jesus had to get him through his times and tribulations. So we're going to take a little bit, uh, bigger look at the Feast of Tabernacles and to see how it relates to Jesus, the joy that Jesus had to get him through uh, his troubling times. So just as a review, Tabernacles is also called Sukkot, the Feast of Sukkot, and Sukkot just means booths. Uh, It's also called the Feast of Ingathering. It's also called the Feast of Nations. It actually has many more names, uh, but we're just going to look at a few things about Tabernacles. Uh, It's on uh, Tishri 15, so it's five days after Yom Kippur, 15 days after Rosh Hashanah. The themes of uh, Tabernacles are, it's all about, it, well, it's a seven-day feast. It's all about harvest. It's all about God's blessings for abundance and, and of abundance. It's all about God sending the fall rains because they needed the fall. You know, they lived in a desert. They needed the fall rains for the winter uh, wheat, uh, winter barley to keep growing through the winter season. Tabernacles was the biggest celebration of the entire year. It was all about great joy and rejoicing. It's a picture of the hope. It's a picture of the millennial kingdom when all nations will come together and live in peace under the Messiah. The Messiah will be the ruler of the messianic kingdom, uh, the millennial kingdom to come. And tabernacles is the picture of the original Thanksgiving. How many of you know that the feasts given by God often played into things we even do today? Uh, For Passover, Passover was obviously where Easter came from. Uh, But how many of you know that Passover is also where spring cleaning came from? For Passover, you prepared your house uh, to celebrate Passover by cleaning your house very thoroughly. And it's a very interesting tradition that has a lot around it. Uh, But Thanksgiving comes from the Feast of Tabernacles. So our Feast of Thanksgiving is actually a picture of the picture that was given in Tabernacles. And so it's the original Thanksgiving. And it comes from Leviticus uh, chapter 23, this is verse 40. It says, you are to rejoice before Yahweh your God seven days. And so they were even commanded to rejoice. So no frowny faces, no pouty faces. Uh, It says you are to rejoice before Yahweh your God seven days. So for seven days you were commanded to be happy, commanded to rejoice. So it was a time of great joy. And Tabernacles means uh, booths. Now, a booth, you know, we think of, you know, something at a fair, but really a booth was a tent. Uh, It was a temporary um, housing, uh, which would have been much more common back then than today. I mean, we really don't relate to tents like they uh, did back then. It it was something you lived in uh, when the children of Israel left Egypt, which this commemorates, they lived in tents. It had to be very portable. They wandered in the desert for 40 years, so it had to be a very portable device that they had to get, get around with. And so 
it, and the, the, the dwelling in booths comes in, again, this is Leviticus 23, this is verses 42 and 43. It says, you shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. That your generation may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I, when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So three times God is saying, look, for this festival, this is what you need to do. You need to dwell in booths, dwell in tents. It's tabernacles. These are all similar words meaning the same thing. And so in modern days, it looks like this. So this is a modern sukkah or a modern booth or a modern tabernacle uh, that the Jewish people to this day build wherever they are at the beginning. Of, so before this feast is, comes, as the really from Yom Kippur until Tabernacles, those five days, they're getting ready for the Feast of Tabernacles, and they're building these uh, sukkahs, these booths, these uh, temporary dwelling places. And the pattern is very much similar. And uh, they often are to have only three walls. They often are to be made very uh, unsturdily. Uh, the, the roof is made to be leaky, and so you can actually see through the roof. You, the, by tradition, you're supposed to be able to be able to look through the roof and see stars. So it's not a very sturdy dwelling. And it's meant to portray that by our own hands, we can't build things very reliable. And that really our dependence and our reliance are in God. We, our supply is from God. Our protection is from God. Um, our, you know, even in the things we build, you know, we build things, yes, but really we have to realize that God is our, you know, our all in all. And so these booths were meant to be very shaky and very temporary. And, but they were also meant to be beautified. They were meant to be decorated and very pretty uh, people go through very elaborate, uh, you know, you know, put carpeting in them and, you know, decorate with fruit and lights. Uh, so it was meant to be very much uh, beautif beautified uh, to show that we love God and that we honor his commandments and we go above and beyond what we're asked to do. I mean, that's the, the picture anyway. We're supposed to go above and beyond he, what, is, what he's commanded of us and do it with a very joyful heart. So even in the building of these booths, uh, they did it with great joy, and they went and beautified them in a wonderful way. But the picture is this. They were meant to be temporary. So the emphasis of the tabernacles that they built to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles was that the booths were to be very temporary, and the reliance really is on God as our uh, you know, source of our supply, the source of our protection, uh, the source of our completion, our completeness always has to be in God. And that it's bigger than just the booth. The earth is also very temporary, and there's plenty of verses about this. Uh, this is from Hebrews chapter 1. It says, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish. And so even in all through the Old Testament and the New Testament, the uh, emphasis on earth is that it's a very temporary thing, and there's something better coming in the future. And that's the picture that we have to have of this earth as well is that it's a temporary dwelling place for us and that God has something very much you know better in mind. Another verse says our citizenship is in heaven because there's you know the citizenship in earth is it going to be a temporary thing so you really want your citizenship to be something uh, you know citizen of some place more permanent which would be heaven and uh, we are waiting for Jesus Christ our Savior you know to take us to a better place. I mean that's really where all this comes from. And that not only is the earth temporary, but our bodies are temporary as well. And we know there's many verses about this as well, uh, that our bodies are just a temporary thing. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, For we know that if our house here on earth, our tent, our bodies really, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, everlasting in the heavens. So we have a, a body that is very temporal now and very mortal. Uh, but one day when Jesus Christ returns, we will put on immortality and then, ha and then we'll have a booth, a tent, a tabernacle that is much more durable than the one we have now. And here's another verse uh, to that same effect. So this is Second Peter chapter 1. It says, knowing that the putting off of my tent, this is Peter talking, comes swiftly even as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. So even Peter writing about his own body is saying, look, this is just a temporary thing, and I know something better is coming. And that better thing is a, 
is an incorruptible and immortal body that we will have in the future when our dwelling place also will be uh, forever with God. And so the, the picture of that would be something that would bring you great joy, and certainly that is true. So now we're going to read a few of the verses uh, that, that are uh, come from the liturgy of the Feast of Tabernacles. So when they got together on the Feast of Tabernacles, the children of Israel, these are some of the verses that they would have been reading from the Old Testament. So this is from Amos chapter 9. It says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills will melt. And it's the picture there is melt with goodness, melt with great things, you know, glad tidings and very much abundance. Verse 14 says, And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and shall drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat, and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. And so that was very comforting to the, the children of Israel, knowing that a future was coming when they wouldn't be bullied any more by the, by the nations of the earth, and that they would have a permanent place with God. And so that was a source of great joy for them. And projecting forward into the future, this is from the book of Revelations, uh, chapter 19, it says, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Again, these are the, the catchphrases, the uh, key phrases that let us know that the themes here are the themes of the Feast of Tabernacles. So let us rejoice and be exceedingly glad, and let us give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And it was granted for her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the holy ones. This is from Revelation for, uh, chapter 20. Blessed and holy is whoever has a part in the first resurrection. Over these people, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him a thousand years. And so these are pictures of the Feast of Tabernacle, not only in the past, but also in the future. And the Tabernacles was one of the feasts that, you, that everyone had to go to Jerusalem for. And so all the males were commanded to go to Jerusalem. And when they went to Jerusalem, it was called Aliyah. Aliyah means up to, to go up to something, uh, you know, up in elevation, up in stature, up in your, you know, uh, you know, your life to make your life better. But it was to go up to Jerusalem. And so these were the three, really the three uh, harvest feasts were the ones that, that all males of Israel had to go up to Jerusalem for. So Passover uh, was the first um, of the harvest feasts. And you'll, you'll notice that they were harvest feasts of physical crops, but the picture was something bigger. So the picture of the eventual harvest that these feasts were going to stand for was something bigger than just physical crops. So Passover was the feast of, of, of which was included the Feast of first fruits. So Passover, Unleavened Bread, and Feast of Firstfruits. But it was uh, to commemorate the barley harvest. So you went up to Jerusalem to worship God and to honor God, uh, to praise God for the barley harvest. But if you'll notice, it was the time of harvest of the Messiah. So the, the Messiah was harvested to speak of, you know, to, to look at it in that light, during the Feast of First Fruits. So the Feast first of First Fruits was a harvest feast, but it was all about the harvest of the Messiah. Pentecost was the next harvest feast, which was all about the wheat harvest, but it was all about the start of the Church of the Body of Christ, and then, and by definition, our harvest. So the, the Church of the Body of Christ was started during Pentecost and would have been really a picture of our place in God's big picture, the harvest of the Body of Christ. And then tabernacles, which I told you one of, the, one of the names of the Feast of Tabernacles was the Feast of Nations, and really is going to be the harvest of the world. So it's going to be a picture of uh, the, uh, not only the grape, the fruit harvest, which comes in the fall, but the, har the harvest of the entire world in the future millennial kingdom. And so these were times when everyone up to, went up to Jerusalem to celebrate these harvest feasts. 
And Tabernacles is the only feast that it says is to be done forever. Now, if that just means the Millennial Kingdom and our term for forever is not quite right, I don't know. Or if it's going to be celebrated in the new uh, heaven and earth, I don't know that either. We'd have to look at that in much more detail. But in Zechariah 14, it talks about going up year from year to the Feast of Pentecost. And three times in this little uh, section of Scripture, it says if you don't come up, bad things are going to happen to you. So nations that don't come up for the Feast of Tabernacles during the Millennial Kingdom, it says they won't get rain, it says they're going to get punished, bad things are going to happen to them. And so it's a feast not only in this in the past, not only something that we can celebrate in the present just to see the pictures of what's coming in the future, but it's also a feast uh, that will be celebrated in the future as well. So that's all very interesting. And this was God's biggest party of the year. So the Feast of Tabernacles was not only the last of the seven feasts of the year, it's also the biggest party of the year. And so I'm going to show you a description now that was, uh, that was uh, in, the, in the, the writings about the Torah. So the Jewish sages and rabbis of old used to write about the Torah, and those written histories uh, is called the Talmud. And there's, there's Talmuds, many versions, you know, very much writings uh, about the Torah in these very, you know, different versions of uh, the Talmuds. And so in, in one of the writings in the Talmud, which, so the Talmud is not given by God, but it's just histories and traditions written down by generations of rabbis. But this is one of the descriptions of the Feast of Tabernacles written in the Talmud. And so this is the description that this rabbi talked about what Tabernacles was like in the old days. And, it, and he says, during the days of the water libation ceremony, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, we barely got to sleep at all. Now, remember, this is for seven days. This whole thing is going on. And this is the kind of picture of what was going on. In the first hour of the day, uh, saw us attending to the daily offering. Following this, we were engaged in prayer and afterwards the additional offering. Then we ate, and it was already time to attend the afternoon service. And this was followed by the celebration of the festival of the water libation, which lasted the entire night, and then we would begin again. And so this was a seven-day, all-day, all-night party. And it was a time of great rejoicing that really went on for just about 24 hours. And all of Israel was there. And, um, you know, it was this huge crowd. It was this big party. And it was just amazing. Now, they also, uh, in, the, in the court of the women, uh, they would put up these large poles, and they were uh, 75 feet tall poles, four of them. So 75 feet, that's seven and a half stories tall. Uh, these huge poles, on the top of each pole were four big lights. So each pole held four big, you know, these huge bowls uh, that they would put oil in. And each of the bowls would have wicks in them, and the wicks were made out of uh, old priest garments. Remember, the garments wore uh, uh, gar uh, the priests wore garments of linen. Uh, as those garments would become stained over time from the blood of all the sacrifices, they couldn't get them clean anymore. They would cut these um, garments into strips where they would get the swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes was cut up uh, priestly garments. And they would wind these garments into wicks. They'd put these wicks into these big bowls filled with oil, and then they would light them. And at night, uh, these lights were lit, so four poles, four big bowls on each pole. And it says that when these wicks were lit, that the courtyard was, was so lit up that it actually lit up the whole city of Jerusalem. And at those times, or in those times, Jerusalem was called the light of the world, or a shining city on the hill. The shining city on the hill was what Jerusalem was called in these, this day and time. And so Jerusalem was called the light of the world. And under these lights, these people would celebrate the entire night through. There'd be you know, much dancing and celebrating and a lot of singing. Um, it was just this huge party. And it went on through the night. And so People would uh, people do, have done paintings to show the representation of what this may have looked like in that day, uh, and this is a, a split painting. I'm going to show you the first half here. So this would have been during the daytime. 
Now, if you remember, I said that the, uh, those huge light poles you can see there were placed in the court of the women, and so the women could not be in those courtyards. And so what they did is they built, um, uh, if you'll see uh, along the edges of the top of the temple, uh, they built risers and uh, standing areas, observing areas where the women would go. So the women would go up high on these, uh, these uh, tiered areas on the sides, and actually look down at, at all the men and the priests uh, who were in the courtyards uh, doing the singing and the liturgy and the praying. Uh, you know, obviously the women were singing and praying too, but, but, uh, but the courtyard was, was made to have the, house these lights, and so they, the, the temple was kind of rearranged uh, just for the celebration. And then at night, the, uh, the four poles with the four lights on each one were lit, and so there was a great amount of light. Uh, that was shown, and there was a great celebration all through the night. So all the dancing and all the celebrating went on through the night. And then after the seven days came the eighth day, and the eighth day was a celebration all by itself. The eighth day was given by God to be a picture of uh, the, re well, in fact, the eighth day was called the rejoicing in the Torah. So there's a Hebrew term for that. Uh, but it was basically a, a time to rejoice in the giving and the, the, the very act that God gave us the Torah and the celebrating the Torah itself as the law of God, as the instruction of God, as the teaching of God. But the eighth day, the number eight, also commem uh, commemorates a new beginning. So after seven days was the first day of the week or the eighth day of the week, and it was to celebrate a new week, a new beginning, a new day. And so the number eight in the Bible always commemorates a new beginning. And so the eighth day, the celebration of the eighth day, was also the celebration of the new heaven and the new earth. And so we're going to see that in this celebration as well. And I'm going to say that, yes, it was a picture of the, of the, uh, the Torah, the written Torah, but I'm going to bet that in the future, the eighth day, when we celebrate it in the Millennial Kingdom, is going to be a picture of the living word, who is the Messiah. And so it's going to be a day devoted just to celebrating the Messiah. And so I think that'll be an amazing time. And here's one of the verses about that. It says, and this is from Habakkuk, uh, verse uh, chapter 2. It says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as waters cover the sea. And so there'll be a great celebrating on a future eighth day celebration when it will be a, just a, a celebration of the Messiah himself. So this is also a celebration of the eighth day as described in the book of Revelation. So this is Revelation chapter 21. See if you can pick up the themes here. It says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Sounds like the eighth day to me. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away and the sea is no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, <coughs> made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of the throne saying, look, the tabernacle of God is with man and he shall live with him. The ultimate celebration of tabernacles is when God will live with us permanently and there won't be any more temporary booths or anything. Everything will be permanent. So it's the tabernacle of God is with man and he will live with them and he will be his people and God himself will be with them. And, and be their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more, neither will there be mourning, for crying nor pain any more. The former things have passed away. And so the only thing left really will be joy. And so that no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, really that just leaves joy all the time. God will live with us permanently, we'll have our new bodies, we'll live in a new heaven and earth, it will be an amazing time. Well now, the the next little segment we're going to talk about here helps to really bring home the Feast of Tabernacles. And it comes from the fact that Jesus was actually at, and it was actually written down when he was at his last Feast of Tabernacles, and that's in John chapter 7. So in the Gospel of John chapter 7, it talks about Jesus at the last Feast of Tabernacles he was at, and what the, the, the things that he went through, the things that he said there, is very enlightening if we go back and look at them now. And so we're going to talk about Jesus, or Yeshua is his Hebrew name, Jesus at Tabernacles, and see if we can't glean a few things about what Tabernacles 
meant to him. And so now, uh, so this is John chapter 7. In verse 2, it says, Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of tabernacles, was near. And according to Josephus, Josephus was an, a historian of the Jewish people back in the, in the, of the, about the time that, that the New Testament was being written. Uh, Josephus estimated that at the time of these feasts, between two and two and a half million people would have been in Jerusalem. So this would have been a huge crowds uh, in those days of you know, Jewish people from all over the known world would come to these feasts because they were commanded to come from God, and especially this one, which is all about joy and rejoicing. Everybody wanted to be at this huge party, the biggest party of the year. So the Feast of Tabernacles was near. The place would have been slammed with people. This would have been a huge, huge crowd. And if you remember in, the, uh, in John chapter 7, Jesus' brothers were taunting him to go up to the feast and show himself. Because if you remember, they're saying things like, look, you know, why would you hide yourself here? If you're all that, if you're really this you know, great you know, mystic guy, why don't you go up to the feast and show yourself? So his brothers didn't really believe that he was the Messiah. And Jesus says, no, it's not my time. You guys go up, but I'm not really going up now. And so his brothers left and went up to the feast. And then it says, he went up afterward. So he didn't go up openly to the Feast of Tabernacles, but he went up in secret. And in verse 14 says, now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. And so this is very interesting. Jesus is at Tabernacles and he's teaching. And verse 15 says, therefore the Jews were amazed saying, how does, how does this man know letters? How does he know all this stuff? having never learned. Now, you remember Jesus was just thought of as a bumpkin. Uh, he would have been, you know, somebody from Nazareth, you know, dressed in the, you know, the, you know, the dress of his area where he grew up. And so they would have seen that, you know, he was just this peasant guy. He wasn't really, you know, all that in their thinking. And so they would have said, you know, you know, how does this guy know anything? How does he know all this great stuff that he's teaching? And the key is here. And he says in verse 16, Jesus said, therefore, uh, my teaching is not mine, but his that sent me. Now, so keep in mind that all the things we're going to talk about that Jesus says from this point on are not from his understanding, but things given by God for him to say at the moment he says them. You know, I, I believe not only was Jesus speaking for God, he was saying things at the right time, in the right place, and in the right way to get maximum impact for people to understand this was something important that they needed to know. So not only is his teaching not from himself, but it's from God, but also how he says it, where he says it, why he says it, when it says it, all that is from God. And it, this is going to be very detailed in these next few verses. Okay, so we're going to skip now forward to verse 37. It says, now on the last day, the great day of the feast. So this is a special day. This is the last day of the feast. This is a big deal. You know, everybody would have been trying to jam into the temple, you know, to catch every prayer, every song, every, you know, tradition that went on. They wanted to be there for, for this last and great day of the feast. It says, Jesus stood and cried out. Now, if, if you see that Jesus stood, I'm going to say, what was everyone else doing? You know, in the, the position of prayer, the position to be in when people were teaching was to be sitting. And so Jesus would have been in the temple in the middle of all this, you know, huge, you know, group of people. He would have been sitting. And it says, Jesus stood and cried out. Now, in my mind, I get he is definitely interrupting something here. If he stands up and then he cries out, there's something going on of which standing and crying out would have not been part of. And so Jesus is standing up. He's in the middle of this service. He's interrupting something, and I'm going to say at a very specific time in my heart, that's the way I'm seeing this, and we'll see if this isn't true as we go through this. He's standing up. He's crying out. He's interrupting something, and he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who is believing in me, as the scripture has said, will have rivers of living water flowing out of his belly. So he's standing up, he's crying out, and he's saying something very specific here. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who is believing in me, as the scripture has said, will have rivers of living water flowing out of his belly. So now let's keep in mind the context here. He's in the temple. 
it, you know, the whole time as we read, there's a big, you know, the celebration is going on all day. These people are basically in the temple all day long. Uh, there's much prayer. There's much singing. Uh, the songs, the songbook, you know, we have the songbook of those ancient days. Remember when it says uh, after the Last Supper, it says they sang a hymn and they went out into the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Well, wouldn't you like to know the hymn they were singing? We have the hymn book. All the hymns and songs that they sang in those ancient, ancient days came from the Psalms, Book of Psalms. It came from other chapters of uh, the Old Testament, which were known to be songs in those days. So there was no separate songbook. We have all the songs of all the songbooks of the Old Testament. And so the Psalms, or the songs for tabernacles would have come from Psalms, especially 113 through 118, which are called the Hallel, which is where we get the word hallelujah from, Hallel. And so Psalms 113 through 118 and other songs of Scripture, these would have been the songs they were singing. And there would have been some uh, very interesting things going on in the, during the Feast of Tabernacles. And this is one of the things that would have been going on. In those days, the, there were 24 courses of priests, and they were divided up into three groups. Uh, the first group would have been sacrificing animals all day long. That would have been their whole job for the seven days of the feast, was to sacrifice all the animals that were given uh, to be sacrificed, uh, you know, by God, he gave all this instruction in the Old Testament. So one group would have been sacrificing animals all day long. The second group would have had the job of going out through the eastern gate every day uh, to cut down willow branches. And these branches would have been 25 to 30 feet long uh, branches. And they would have gone out down through the valley, uh, cut these branches down, and then come back waving the branches in unison. So they would like take a step and wave the branches, take a step and wave the branches, you know, because they're 25, 30 feet long. You weren't waving them like this. It would have been a big wave like this, a big wave like that, but it have been hundreds and hundreds, you know, 24 courses of priests. Uh, these were hundreds of priests in, in each of these groups. So it would have been a, a huge uh, procession of, of priests coming back from this valley waving these huge willow branches and coming back through the eastern gate to the temple. And the third group would have been the group that was performing the water libation, the water pouring ceremony that I've already alluded to. And this group contained the high priest. And now you have to think about this. Each of these groups are doing their thing. There would have been crowds of people that would have been watching the sacrifice. There would have been crowds of people that have gone with the priests to watch the willow cutting ceremony and the waving ceremony. And then there would have been groups of people going down to watch the water libation, the water you know, pouring ceremony. And so there was this huge groups of priests and huge groups of people watching these ceremonies. So it was said of the water pouring ceremony and the water libation ceremony that whoever has not seen the celebration of the water libation has never experienced the feeling of true joy. So now keep in mind, not only was there big, you know, not only was this whole ceremony, I mean, this whole feast uh, uh, party and a great so source of joy and rejoicing, but each of the ceremonies going on within the ceremony were also a so source of great joy. And now these were temple traditions. Now, nowhere in the Old Testament does it say, you know, you need to go get this water, you need to pour it out. I mean, not in the detail that they were doing it. Uh, you know, it was not given per se to do these things in the way they did them. So these were traditions. But traditions were not wrong if they still pointed to the pictures of the Messiah. And as we're going to see, these were great pictures of the Messiah. And so they were traditions, but they were also done in Jesus' day. So these were things that Jesus would have seen and, and been part of, you know, in the crowds watching these traditions. And so you have this for this water, you know, libation ceremony. You got this huge joyful singing procession. Uh, it's going out through the water gate. It's going down south, down out of the temple to the pool of Siloam. There would have been a, the priest, the chief priest, the, the head priest would have had this great uh, golden vessel. And he was going down to the Pool of Siloam to get living water. The Pool of Siloam, the water was moving there. So it was called living water, or Mayim Hayim, you know, was the Jewish term. And this living water, obviously, we would see it now as Holy Spirit. The, the living water was 
you know, you know, Jesus gave the living water, which was Holy Spirit that we all have now if you're born again. So, but the picture was this golden vase. Remember, gold was a medal of royalty. So it was a picture of royalty. It would have been a picture of the Messiah. And they'd go down to the Pool of Siloam where the living water was. They would have scooped up a pitcher full of living water in this golden vase. And another priest would have had a silver pitcher. Remember, silver was the medal of redemption. Another pitcher, uh, the, another priest would have had the silver pitcher, and that was full of wine or the blood of the grapes, really representing the blood of Yeshua that he was going to spill for us so that we could be redeemed. You know, silver is the medal of redemption, as I said. So you got the high priest with a golden vase full of living water. You got a priest holding uh, a, va a silver pitcher full of wine, representing the blood of the Messiah. And then they would have turned around and headed back for the temple. So this would have been a great procession down to the Pool of Siloam, scooping up this living water back up to the temple uh, to see or to bring it into the temple. And here's a painting. Uh, you know, to me, this painting doesn't do justice to the way I pictured in my mind. But this was a painting of the high priest bending down to scoop up the living water out of the Pool of Siloam. And you can see all the priests, you know, behind him going up the steps, uh, leading back up to the temple way up on the hill back there. And it's hard to see, but there's crowds of people back up on the hill uh, watching this happen. You know, I'm sure in living, you know, you know, in living, uh, you know, the ceremony would have been much more dramatic. But, you know, this is an artist's rep representation of that. But in reality, you know, in the, the, what was going on then is you had the living water, you had the water and the wine coming back to the temple uh, to be poured out on the altar every morning uh, during this celebration of the water pouring. So, so they would have gone down, scooped up this water, and then come back up and poured it onto the temple. The wine and the water would have got poured, poured into the altar with great celebration. Remember what I, you know, the, the quote was, if you've not seen this, you've not experienced real joy. And so this would have been just an amazing picture. Now, I further believe that when we get to heaven, there's going to be a big DVD bank of all the, all the pictures of all these things as they actually happen. And we'll be able to see Adam and Eve and, the, you know, how the, the Garden of Eden thing actually played out. And I think we'll be able to see these ceremonies and the way they really happen. And we'll be able to go, mm, you know, I didn't really see it like that, but that's pretty amazing. And so we'll be able to get to see all these things, I think, one day. But now here's what's really going on, is that they, this, the Feast of Tabernacles was all about praying to Yahweh for the rain for the fall and winter crops. So this was all about, uh, it was uh, making uh, sacrifice to God. Uh, it was, uh, you know, getting back in alignment and harmony with God. It was about praying to God for the fall and the winter rains, because as I said, they lived in a desert. They needed these rains for the crops to grow and for them to have life in the future, you know, because they didn't have Walmarts and they didn't have, you know, shopping centers where if the crops didn't come in, they could just go down and get more wheat or more barley or more grapes. They had to have these rains for these things to happen. And so think about this now, praying to Yahweh for the rain to come from heaven to have life in the next year. And so we would see that as they're praying for living water. Remember, rain is the, the living water to come from heaven because that rain gave life. So they were praying for living water to come from heaven to bring them life, you know, crops for the next year and life to come. And what is all this except pictures of Yeshua? Every description of every ceremony in every feast that God gave are pictures of the Messiah. All the, you know, all the pictures of the Passover lamb, all the pictures of sin being buried during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the picture of the high priest going into the Holy of Holies with a barley or a sheaf, a sheaf of barley during the Feast of First Fruits was the picture of you know, the Messiah, when he actually did that, he went into the Holy of Holies when he got up from the dead and presented himself as the first fruits from the dead. The picture of Pentecost, when the church of the body of Christ began, the Pentecost was a picture of us when we got there and actually, you know, had that happen in the first century. And all these fall feasts as well are pictures of the Messiah and the way he's actually going to fulfill these feasts. So all these things are pictures of the Messiah. And on that last great day of the feast, 
not only did they parade once around the altar and then poured out the water and the wine, but on this day they marched seven times around the altar. So it was the Jericho march around the altar on the last great day of the feast to pour out the water and the wine uh, during the ceremony of the water pouring. And so the last great day of the feast it was the big day. Everyone, everybody wanted to be there to see this Jericho march around the altar, to see the final water pouring ceremony, the water and the wine were poured out. And in the middle of all this, Jesus stands up and he cries out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who is believing in me, as the scripture has said, will have rivers of living water flowing out of his belly. Well, the problem here is that it says, as the scripture said. And the problem is, no one really knows where the scripture came from, where Jesus says, as the scripture said. In fact, if you read in commentaries about this, you know, John chapter 7, we're reading from John chapter 7. If you read commentaries about this, people say, we don't actually know what, re what reference, what scripture Jesus is referring to. When Jesus says, as the scripture said, well, let me tell you, if Jesus says, as the scripture said, there has to be a reference from the Old Testament that he is getting this from. And so the key to this is seeing that one of the songs they sang in the liturgy of the Feast of Tabernacles was Isaiah chapter 12. Now, Isaiah chapter 12, I don't know if you've read the book of Isaiah, but the chapters in Isaiah are huge, 40 verses long, 50 verses long, 60 verses long. The chapters of Isaiah are huge. Chapter 12 has six verses, six verses. This was not meant to be a, uh, a chapter to read from. This was meant to be a song. Isaiah chapter 12, six verses long, was a song, and this song was actually sang during the Feast of Tabernacles back in that day. And so we're going to read a couple verses out of Isaiah chapter 12, and let's see if we can learn anything from it. So this is Isaiah chapter 12, verses verse 2 and verse 3. We're going to read verse 2, verse 3. It says, Behold, God is my salvation. I remember this was a song. This would have been sang during the Feast of Tabernacles by the, high pri by the priests. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For Yah, Yahweh, is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Verse 3 says this, Therefore with joy will you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Now the key word, is there, is the key word there is joy. And when we read the joy, what should we think of? The Feast of Tabernacles. So this was a song that was sung during the Feast of Tabernacles. So behold, my God or God is my salvation, I will trust and I will not be afraid, for Yah, Yahweh, is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Now, also, as a sidelight, when Moses and the children of Israel came up out of the Red Sea, the song that was sung uh, at that time, this is a quote actually from that uh, song as well. And so this was a verse very well known for them, requoted here by Isaiah. And therefore, with joy will I draw water out of the wells of salvation. Now, the key to this comes here. What is the Hebrew word for salvation? The Hebrew word for salvation? Hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, Yeshua. So, Yeshua is the Hebrew word for salvation. So, let's read these two verses again, but let's change the word to Yeshua. It says, Behold, God is my Yeshua. And I don't believe that this is a Trinitarian formula here. I believe this is, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I believe that's what Jesus is saying here, or what, what is being communicated here, is that if you've seen the Messiah, you've seen the Father. So behold, God is my Yeshua. I will trust and I will not be afraid, for Yah, Yahweh, is my strength and song, and he has become my Yeshua. Therefore, with joy will you draw water out of the wells of Yeshua. So, um, uh, went backwards, hang on. So, let's look at this word wells. So, the Hebrew word for wells, it not only means a well, 
but it can also mean a fountain. It also is translated fountains, plural. But one of the, defini one of the definitions for this Hebrew word is what comes from within a person. So something that wells up from within a person, that which pertains to life, the life of a person, you know, that which wells up from within a person and gives life. And now let's look at the New Testament, because remember, Jesus, or Jesus is, stands up and cries, anyone who's thirsty come unto me, for out of my belly, you know, out of his belly will come rivers of water. Well, that word belly in the New Testament means internal organs. The way that Greek word is used, it means internal organs, and it's actually translated as womb. Well, what internal organ actually does give life, and that is the womb of a woman. So the word in the New Testament, the Greek word, is, is actually translated in some places as womb. So in the Old Testament, it says uh, in, in Isaiah chapter 12, it says, Therefore with joy will you draw water out of the wells of Yeshua. And in the Hebrew, it can mean that which comes from within a person. In the New Testament, it certainly means that which can, which can, can come from with, uh, in a new or within the abdomen, you know, the womb that comes from within a person. And so it looks like the scripture mentioned in John chapter 7 actually is Isaiah 12, verse 3. And so now putting this together, when Jesus stands and cries out, is he actually interrupting the singing of that song? In the instant, they're singing Isaiah chapter 12, and they get to verse 3, you know, out of the wells of Messiah, uh, you know, it says, um, with joy, you shall draw waters out of the wells of Yeshua. Is that the point that he actually stands up and cries out, look, if you're thirsty, come to me. I'm the guy they're sing you are singing about. Now, if this was a Cecil B. DeMille production, you know that this would be the moment he would stand up and with great dramatic effect say, hey, you know what? I'm the guy. This is the place. This is the scripture. This is the description of me right here, right now. I'm the guy that you are singing about. Out of my, you know, if you're thirsty, come to me, for out of my wells is going to come this living water, out of my belly. And so one final part about this to drive this home that I believe this is actually the point that Jesus cries out, interrupts the worship service, you know, stands up, cries out, and says this, is that because I, the, one of the verses from Isaiah we didn't read was verse 6. Remember I said Isaiah 12 is only six verses? Look what it says in verse 6. So here's Jesus standing up, crying out, and here's the finishing verse of this song. Verse 6, it says, Cry aloud and shout, you inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel who is standing in your midst. Is that the exact picture of this last great day of the Feast of Tabernacles? Jesus stands up in the midst of this huge group of men sitting. You know, the women were watching from above. Jesus stands up in the midst of them and says, look, I am the guy. This song is about me, for it's talking about, you know, the, you know, the living waters that are going to come from me in the future. And the last verse, and so does he sit down then and they finish the song, or does he just stand there and let them get to verse 6, you know, after he, you know, they get on with the singing after he interrupts them. And they say, holy is the one of Israel who is standing right in front of your eyes. Now, clearly, no one got that. But I'll bet when the, after Jesus ascended into heaven, just before the Feast of Pentecost, and the disciples were starting to put this together, they would have gone, holy cats. Remember that last Feast of Tabernacles? Oh my gosh, he was right there in the middle of it. And the, you know, the, the pictures of this would have been just amazing, breathtaking to them. All right, so let's recap. You got this big joyful group that came up from the Pool of Siloam, representing the living water and representing the blood of the Messiah. And before they entered into the temple, they would have been standing right outside the, the gate of the temple, waiting to come in. You got this big joyful group waving willow branches, 
waiting at the eastern gate to come in. And now remember, here's a little side light. You know, so picture this. You got all these priests waving these big, huge branches. What would that have sounded like? You got hundreds and hundreds of priests that are waving 25 to 30 foot long willow branches, all waving them in unison back and forth, hundreds of these. What would that have sounded like? Have you ever been out in your yard or out in the forest when the wind blows through the trees? And that's not, you know, just hundreds of, I mean, you know, that's, that's, you know, a few trees. You'd have heard this, you know, huge rustling wind. Well, the, the Hebrew word for wind is ruach. And what does that mean in the Old Testament when you read ruach? It's all about the spirit of God. So you've got, you got the living water coming in, the blood coming in from one gate. You've got the wind representing the Spirit of God coming in to another gate, and they would have waited at those gates because part of the tradition was then you had a priest who stood up in a corner of the temple where everyone could see and hear, and he would have been playing a flute. Now, a flute was one of the instruments that God gave in the Old Testament that would have been permissible to have in the temple. You could only have certain instruments in the temple. A flute was one of them. A flute was made out of a hollow tube, and the tube would have been pierced with uh, pierced to make the holes to make music. So the flute would have made music when you blew through it. Well, the pierced was called, or the flute would have known as a pierced instrument. The person playing the flute would have been called the pierced one. And so you got this high pri or this priest standing up in the corner of the temple where everyone can see and everyone can hear, and he would have been known as the pierced one. And on the signal that he gave in playing this flute, the living water and the blood would have come in through one gate of the temple, and the wind, the ruach, the spirit of God would have come in through another gate of the temple, and they both would have met up there, met up there together. And so that is the picture of what's going on uh, every day during the, these worship services. And on this particular day, Jesus gets up and says, I am the guy. Every picture you've seen here today, Everything you've been singing about, about the future coming kingdom, the millennial kingdom, even the future reigns to come from heaven, you're looking at it as the crops for next year. The picture is much bigger than that. It's all about me. That's what Jesus would have been saying when he stood up on that last great day of the feast. So what were the reasons for Yeshua's joy? What were the reasons for Jesus's joy? You know, what if the pictures and themes of tabernacles, and as I've said, we were only skimming the surface here. They're much deeper, much bigger pictures, even still about the Feast of Tabernacles. What if they were all pictures of, you know, the joy that Jesus had in just celebrating this feast as he did year after year with his family? But what if they were pictures of him as well? And he would have been very familiar with these themes. He would have been very familiar with these scriptures. What if he knew that he was the light of the world. He would have known this. You know, they would have, you know, the picture they had was Jerusalem was the light of the world. The tab or the, um, the temple was the light of the world. But Jesus knew it was all about him. And he, you know, in John chapter 8, Jesus stands up and says, I am the light of the world. If you go back and read John chapter 8, which comes right after John chapter 7, this still would have been in the theme in the time of tabernacles. So this feast is still, you know, ongoing. Uh, it's still in the picture of the Feast of Tabernacles. And not only was, you know, the picture of the temple and Jerusalem being the light of the world, but Jesus himself was the light of the world. So he knew he was the future light of the world. He knew he was going to be the living water from heaven. He, you know, he was the living water that came down from God to be the source of Holy Spirit in the future. Jesus says, wait. You know, when he went the first time up into heaven, as he was there talking to the disciples, he says, wait in Jerusalem until I give the promise of the Father, which would have been the living water coming from heaven, which would have been Holy Spirit. So he knew he was the, the living water from heaven, and he was going to be the source of living water from heaven, which would have been Holy Spirit. And he also knew he was the pierced one. It says that they will look on him whom they have pierced. Remember I said that was... That's a liturgy from the Feast of Yom Kippur, but it's also a future picture when Jesus comes back on a future Yom Kippur, and it says, all eyes will see him and mourn over him as one who mourns for a firstborn. So he was literally 
the pierced one and going to be in the future the pierced one that everyone's going to see and get, oh, yeah, this is the guy. And so it would have been pictures of him in all these aspects and also pictures of him being king of kings and lord of lords. Because in Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 6 and 7, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, it's a picture of him as king of kings and lord of lords. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. The government of the future millennial kingdom is going to be on the shoulders of the Messiah. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty Hero, the Father of the Coming Age, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and on his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from that time on forever. Now, this is a picture of him on earth and the millennial kingdom. But if you think about this, where is the Messiah now? The Messiah now, it says it's God in Christ in us. So for us, as, you know, people who are living in the church of the body of Christ, as, you know, it says that, that we are born again. It says when we trust in Jesus, when we, you know, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead when we make Jesus Lord in our life, which all of us as, as Christians have done, his kingdom now is in us. His kingdom is not a physical one on earth. His kingdom is now. We represent holy ground. Everywhere we go, we are the holy of holies. You know, we represent the most sacred place on earth because it's God in Christ in us. So his government now is not a future government, a physical government someplace on earth, but his government lives within us. And so he's our wonderful. He's our counselor. The Messiah is our mighty hero. He's, you know, he is the father of the coming age, but he's our father now. You know, he's the, the father of the one, you know, he fathered us through his death and resurrection. I mean, God is our heavenly father, yes. But Jesus Christ is our head. We're his body. You know, he's our head. He's our, our governor, our prince of peace. And it says that the increase of his government and of peace, there is no end. Now think about that. He governs within us if we let him. His peace is within us if we let it be. So the, the government that will have no end, the peace will have no end, is as we let it be in our lives. As we put Yeshua on more and more in our hearts and minds, we're going to understand his governance over us more. We're going to understand his love for us more. We're going to understand his peace for us more. So not only is he going to be a physical ruler on earth, yes, but he's also now living inside of us with justice to establish his government within us, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness forever and ever. So you know what? That's real joy. So the joy that he, and the hope that he had was so big because of all these pictures that he had that he could bear any suffering that he was going through in his life. It wasn't just the picture of me. It was the bigger, much bigger picture that was going on around him. He understood that the Feast of Tabernacles uh, was a picture of his future rulership. And through that, he could see his future much more clearly. And if we are to have the mind of Christ, it says in Philippians chapter 2, it says, have this mind also in you, that was in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, you know, we can put his mind on, in, you know, we can put, have the same mind in us now. So if we are to have his mind now, then we are to put on the mind of Christ and to see with spiritual eyes like he did. So in, in Ephesians chapter 1, it says that we can have the eyes of our understanding enlightened, that you might know the hope of his calling what the riches of his glory of inheritance in the holy ones is. So we can put on the mind of Christ. We can see with spiritual eyes like he did. We can see the hope of the future like it's talked about in the Feast of Tabernacles. We can see the inheritance that is coming for us as well. And we, like Jesus did, like Yeshua did, we can see our place in our Heavenly Father's plan. We can see through the prophetic pictures of the feasts 
through these dress rehearsals what our place in the messianic kingdom as well and in the future new heaven and new earth so the same way jesus saw it we can see it as well and when we see it we can see deeper dimensions to our place and what we have through christ jesus our lord so we can see joy with much more detail than we ever have before and if we can see our messiah more clearly we will love him more and if we love him more we can obey him more and if we obey him more we can have more joy because as it talks about in john 15 in this verse when i saw it i almost couldn't believe it but look at this it says if you keep my commandments you will live in my love just as i have kept my father's commandments and live in his love i have spoken these things to you said so, so that the joy i have had will be in you and that your joy may be made full so if we can see messiah more clearly in these pictures that god has given us that are all about the messiah we're going to love him more we're going to obey him more we're going to have more joy because as we see how he has been with us and how he is with us now and our, how our Messiah is going to care for us in the future. Remember, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. If we put that on bigger in our minds, we're going to see the amazing joy that awaits us. And all these things will be come to fruition more and more. And the joy that Jesus had, remember, it was the joy that got him through all those amazing you know, trials and tribulations. That's going to be the joy that's in us now as well. And whatever comes up, Whatever happens in these next few days or months or years, we are going to be able to withstand all that because we'll have the same joy that got him through this, the horrible crucifixion and all that, that he went through. And so, you know, we are going to be part of the picture of that joy. Tabernacles was about us as well, but it wasn't just this small little, you know, vision of joy that I had about me with him, but it's much, it's much bigger, much more detailed. And we can see, like it says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, Who is our hope, our joy, our crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Again, it's all about his coming back. Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy. So we can obey him more. We can see what he went through and the joy that he had to get him through it. And it's that same joy that we can put on in our lives now to get us through this as well. All right, so to leave you, I wanted to come up with an acronym for joy. So I thought about this and I thought, well, what would be something cool to leave people with that they could, they could you know, have this quick acronym about joy, you know, J-O-Y. And I, my first attempt was so lame that I thought, well, I'll share it with you just to see how lame it actually was. So I thought, well, J, well, that's Jesus, right? So I thought, well, i got to somehow get Jesus in there. And so I thought, well, Jesus, well, he's the one to, and I thought, oh, obey. He's the one to obey. And then, hey, you. So Jesus, he's the one obey. Look, hey, you, wake up and obey him. And I thought, well, you can't get more lame than that. So if you were to remember that, you would remember, okay, well, this was the lamest acronym of all time. And maybe that would be enough to help you remember all about the joy of this teaching. But then it dawned on me that God gave us a much better acronym, and that's this. And that's JOY, J-O-Y, Just Obey Yeshua. So even more you know, to note that Jesus wasn't really, it wasn't his real name. Yeshua was his real name. That was his Hebrew name. And I thought, well, that's much better. So you can remember that acronym about joy, just obey Yeshua. And that is the source of our, uh, our strength as well. And so life is coming and life is full of trials and tribulations, but we can proceed with joy. So thank you very much. And I'll leave you with these references here so you can, you know, see them, write them down if you want to get any of these uh, references. Most of them you know already, uh, but there's some great references there to uh, the sources, some of my uh, 
uh, teachings here, and there's a lot of, of references about tabernacles on YouTube and on the internet. If you just put Feast of Tabernacles, you will have amazing websites that correlate much more of this than I've even begun to scratch the surface on. So God bless you. God is great. He loves us. The Messiah is, you know, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, you know, he really blazed the trail to show how we can also blaze a trail to God's right hand. And there's amazing pictures out there about him. We can learn much more about him. So go out there and dig in God's word and learn wonderful things. So God bless you. Thank you for this opportunity to share. Okay, so what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to open up for questions. Uh, questions from last week, if you have questions from last week's teaching or questions from, from this week's teaching. Let me do a couple of things here. I'm going to do this first. And then let's open this up. Sure. Nope, that's not what I wanted. There we go. All right. Okay, everybody is still muted, but you now have the ability to unmute yourself. And let me switch my views here. Oh, Gary, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Well, how is that a picture of life? We're all muted. Uh, <laughs> Our, our voices really are our own. If you don't speak up, the speaking will not get done. I mean, really, in life, we self-mute. I mean, how many times do we have something to say or a situation that we could, you know, that we get in and we could share such amazing things, but we self-mute? I mean, what a great, even here on Zoom, we're seeing pictures of real life and how real life is lived. And really, we have the ability to unmute ourselves at any moment and end the fray of life. So, I mean, pictures of life are all around us if we just wake up and see them. So, interesting. Um, Denise asked, when, uh, when and where will the teaching from last week be available? It's actually already up and available, and uh, it's on the YouTube channel, STF Virtual Fellowship, STF Virtual Fellowship. Uh, or you can uh, search for the video itself, which is entitled Lift Up Your Eyes, Star Update 2016. I Search for either of those, and you'll find the video on YouTube. If you have any trouble with that, just contact me. Now, the, the teaching has not been broken up into little chapters yet, and so it's just there in its glorious four-hour length. <laughs> and so uh, you can just watch it as you need to. If you pause it and go away, you can come back and pick it up right where it was. But the goal would be to break it up into little bite-sized pieces, you know, and it's going to be how it's going to be. And it's, you know, it's, it's a great thing, you know, just to see it anyway. And if you have comments, like I say, like I talked about last time, God works in each of us as individuals. And so you're going to get things that I never did get. You're going to get, th even in this today, you're seeing things already that I have not seen. And so the, bod the way the body of Christ works together is like the human body. The mouth eats, the tongue you know, breaks up the food, the teeth breaks up the food, the saliva gland adds enzymes to begin the process of digestion, the esophagus gets it down to the stomach, the stomach adds, you know, the begins to add digestive juices, the, the duodenum adds more digestive juices, the stomach begins to break down the food. I mean, you need everything involved in digestion to make the nutrients available. And so just like this, the body of Christ is, you know, sees things that I don't see. And, you know, so you can add much more to this than I've ever begun to understand. That's why um, Betsy had a question. Um, the, uh, her question was, is the eclipse coming? I assume, Betsy, you're talking about the eclipse next August. Is the eclipse coming mostly for us to be aware something is coming? Uh, well, yes and no. Um, as I said during the, the video last time, I believe, the, you know, I believe the biggest thing the blood red moons did was to get our eyes into the heaven and our eyes on the feast days because the blood red moons happen in the heaven and they happen on the feast days. So there, and I believe there is something even deeper to that. But yes, I believe the eclipse is something more 
Uh, it is happening on a feast day. It's the first day of Teshuvah. Well, it's not a technically, you know, one of the seven feasts, but it is a day on which uh, the house of Israel was to begin to get their, their hearts and lives ready for the fall festival. So it is happening in the heavens again. It is happening on a, you know, a special day. And it's also, as if you remember, I said the Talmud was, the, the Talmud said that solar eclipses are a bad sign for the nations and lunar eclipses are a bad sign for Israel. So yes and no. Is it, does it have spiritual significance? I'll bet it does because it is a, a solar eclipse and it, I bet it is taught, you know, getting the nations to a point, a point where they need to repent and turn back to God. But it is also a sign to get our eyes off the earth and into the heavens where much bigger pictures are about to happen right after that eclipse. Uh, one thing I want to make sure everybody knows, <clears throat> if you want to ask a question live on the video, um, I'd ask that there's a participants button down at the bottom, and you can hit that, and there's an option there that says uh, to raise your hand. That will notify me that you have a question, and I can switch over to you and, and ask your question. Uh-huh. <laughs> and a couple of people have their, raise, their hands raised here. Let me see. Uh, I don't know if I can in this. Oh, here we go. Betsy has a question. Go ahead, Betsy. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to word this question properly. You said something last week about being able to see the, the future event coming next November during the day. That you could see it. That you could see it during the day. Well, how can you see it during the day? I don't. I didn't understand that. All right. Well, any of the, typically any of the star signs uh, are going to be seen at night, either sun, either after sunset or before sunrise. Anything that time frame, because uh, Mercury can only be seen at sunset and sunrise, and you can't see it the whole rest of the night. Venus is often seen in the twilight, both in the morning and the evening, and then it can't be seen anymore because it's close to the sun. So when the sun leaves the sky in the evening or enters the sky in the morning, that's the best time to see Venus. The only time things can really be seen during the day is if the moon is up, because the moon can be seen during the day, or if there's a supernova. Uh, now, there's, there's been supernovas in history uh, long, long time ago, so before modern times, uh, but they were written about by ancient peoples where they saw bright things in the sky when the sun was up. And so they're very rare. And so we don't know if God is going to use supernovae, or, you know, novae, which would be plural of supernova, as any of the signs of what's coming in the future. But if he did, those were things that possibly could be seen during the day. And so uh, there's a possibility of seeing things during the day, but there's no guarantee that any of these things will be seen during the day. So if I made reference to that, either, either it was an error, and sometimes I, tell, I said, sometimes I get so excited I say things I don't really mean, or skip over whole paragraphs that in my mind I've connected together. So really there's not going to be a lot to see during the day. Obviously the eclipse is going to be seen during the day. Anything that happens with the sun is going to be seen during the day. Uh, but per se, star signs and things like that. And now, now, so one of the things I did say was this, and that is the great star sign of uh, September 23 of 2017. Half of it will be seen at sunset, and the other half will be seen at sunrise, because the sun is in the middle of that great star sign. It says that uh, the sun will be in Virgo, and the whole star sign is taking place in Virgo, and actually some in Leo. And so when the sun sets, you'll be able to see the, the bottom half of Virgo. And when the sun rises, you'll be able to see the top half of Virgo. So the whole <laughs> sign itself will not be able to be seen in its entirety because the sun is in the middle of it. And so that could have been what, what I was referring to as well. And my question is, does that depend on where you live, too, of how much of this you can see? No. Some of the intricacies of it will depend on where you live. Like if you set your star, uh, star program to, to Jupiter or to uh, Jerusalem rather versus setting your star program to Kalamazoo, which is where I set mine, because I only am concerned how it looks here because right. this is where I'm going to be looking from. 
but there will be minor variations on Earth depending on the latitude that you're at when you set your star program. But, the, but those changes will be very small. Okay. Um, Andy Trimble has his hand up. There you go, Andy. You're, un you're unmuted. In trouble. Andy, you there? Well, you may have muted yourself on your keyboard or on your phone screen if you're on the phone. Can you, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, there you go. Great. There you go. Okay. Let me close my door. It's, it's a little noisy outside. First, I want to say, Gary, thank you so much. This has been so uh, enlightening and such a blessing. I listened to that four hour teaching in two parts. I listened to two hours, then took a little break, and then listened to two hours. And I, I'm going to listen to that thing four or five times at least to get all the nuance. Uh, but the one thing that I, I thought of on the eighth day, that's when the book of life will be opened. And I'm wondering if, you know, the seventh day is the uh, seven years of, I mean, the thousand years of uh, the millennial kingdom. And then the eighth day, that last day after it will be the book of life where we will rejoice uh, in, the, in that book, you know, like they rejoiced in the book of scripture, you know, the Torah. Uh, that was what came to my mind when you were talking about it. And uh, I wondered, had you thought about that? Well, that, that book of life will be the Messiah. So you're right. You know, will, there, will it be a time when we'll even know more about Messiah? Um, you know, I mean, his, his, well, he will have done it. Well, part of it will be, I mean, could it be a retirement party? He will have been, the, um, you know, the rule of earth for a thousand years. And really the new heaven and earth, it, it, you know, it says it's not even entered our mind, the things that are going to await us then. And so, Messiah, in a way, is stepping down from his job as ruler of the earth because right. everything it says is going to be then turned over to God. It says, you know, you know, the, the earth is his footstool, and when all things are completed, even the Messiah is going to right. turn everything over to God. And so yeah. it's going to be kind of his retirement party. You know, he's going to get a gold watch in the corner <laughs> office with the windows, and it's going to be, you're right, it's, you know, that is, that, I'd never thought of that. That is going to be the eighth day when that day starts right, right. it's going to be the biggest retirement party of all time and you're right well we see attributes of messiah that even we didn't get during the millennial kingdom and you're right that that book will be completely opened up and we'll see messiahs never before and yeah that's that blows my mind yes amazing and then one other thing uh you when you did the little thing today on uh that pentecost is uh blessings from heaven I wonder, uh, have you ever worked when the manna came down when they were in the wilderness? Do we know if that was Pentecost? You know, did that happen during Pentecost, at, you know, back in the wilderness? Wow, that's, that's a really good point. I mean, that, that would be it. And this is the thing I say, when you start looking at these feasts, you start thinking about them everywhere. And that is a really good point. And I wonder... I wonder if they not only got the manna, I mean, maybe it was like this. They got the manna on one Pentecost. They went a whole year eating manna and were like, we are so tired of this. We want more. And then the, the quail came the next manna and God God's yeah. like, all right, now have you had enough? You know, you guys got to realize I'm the bread of life. You know, it would have been God back then, but Jesus, we see Jesus now as the bread of life. And God was saying, look, I need to be your su sufficiency, not the manna, not the quail. You guys yeah. need to get over this earthly stuff. But that would be a very good you know, thing to look at that, that, I mean, that goes perfectly with gifts from heaven. What, what, what tool is there that, that would help me to figure that out? That is part of the problem because, you know, and that's sort of where you need to start looking at the Talmud, which are the writings about the Torah and people, because sometimes you get clues there where they say, you know, rabbi, blah, 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 because they're quoting from very ancient rabbis. And, they, and, you know, Rabbi blah, 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 you know, said that, you know, this came on this day. And you start to see the picture from the rabbi's eyes, which sometimes can be the only place you, you can get it. Because remember, even the ancient Talmuds were available to Jesus in his day. And so it's not God breathed, but it would have been things that he could have learned from or gotten, you know, pictures from. 
but that is the issue is you know the when the the hebrew bible was written down in english i we lost a lot of the you know the a lot of the you know minute details of what god yeah. really may have meant and it's really hard for us to go back and look to see well in hebrew could you really say this or can you get that and that is part of the problems but you, you know the more you look at it the more you might see this symmetry remember i talked about the symmetry of god where after a while you get you know god always did it this way this right. has really got to be that way and it's sometimes what we need to look at to put these pictures together but i mean you, you bring up very interesting points well thank you again brother we, we love you so much thank you for putting all the effort and and uh, teaching us. It was wonderful. I'll, well, I'll thank you. And keep looking at it through those eyes, you know, your eyes of inspiration, revelation, because that's where we're going to see it more and more. Uh, John Sant has his hand up. John, go ahead. Yeah, I just wondered if, uh, well, someone has a, a list of uh, uh, the astronomical programs that we can download, hopefully for free, that, that we can we can actually see uh, uh, the, the whole star makeup ourselves it's it's like anybody else it's like i can tell you about the book but you'd rather read the book yourself I think. Um, now john did i put so i i put some references in for the the star teaching are those in there now john at the end are they at yeah, the end they're, well they're they're in the description if you go to the the videos page it'll have a description underneath the video and those links are all in that description and oh, you, thanks and i missed it well, do you remember, did I put the star programs in there? Did I put the links to those? Mm, I, don't, I don't remember that. Because if, if I didn't, John, what I'll do is I will go back and put those links in there. And let me just say this about the star programs is you can get free versions of all of them, but I don't advise to get the free versions. I advise to get the most expensive versions. And, and I'm talking five bucks here for the apps, for the phones and the, and the iPads. And I think Sky Safari 4, or no, it's actually Sky Safari 6 now or something like that. It might be 25 bucks. But the beauty of the more expensive versions is they give you all the add-ons. And, I mean, it's things like the satellites and, you know, things you can track in space. But it's also much more detailed pictures of the stars and much more detailed pictures of the constellations and also much more detailed pictures of the little things that are in space that – are, you can't really see with the naked eye, but that the people with telescopes can see, which I believe God also, God also put there to teach us things. Because if you think about this, God made the oceans and the corals and the amazing fish and all the beauty under there, knowing that it would take centuries for us to make diving bells and scuba gear and, you know, to have the, the means to go down and look at the handiwork of the things he plays for us to get blessed by. Well, out in space are minute, uh, you know, nebula and, you know, these amazing stars that are double stars and all this amazing pictures that he knew we would never be able to see for millennia, but he put them out there still for us to enjoy. And if you get the more expensive programs, you're going to see the handiwork of God like you've never imagined. Thank you. Uh, I just took a quick look, Andy, and it looks like, uh, according to Exodus, um, it says that they, um, they, they left, or they, the manna, when they started murmuring about food and God gave them manna was on the 15th, it says of the second month after they had left Egypt. And so they left Egypt on the 15th of the first month so that's it that's, that's around 50 days after passover so yep. that is right well, in the timeline I, i'm not sure if it's it's either the next month or the month after that so you'd have to you'd have to do some some research but it's in exodus 16 if you want to look at it more thank now, you one, one thing to keep in mind is that commentaries are flawed uh you know and and you know, part, you know, the biggest point I make about this is people who believe that, that, you know, Jesus died on a Friday. And the, the picture of that is Jesus said he was going to be in the grave three days and three nights. And 
from Friday afternoon, because, you know, the traditional view is he died on a Friday afternoon. He was, you know, so he was in the grave by sunset on Friday. Well, he got up from the dead before sunrise on Sunday. And there, you can't even get parts of three days and three nights from sunset on Friday to sunrise on Sunday. And so, and, and yet every commentary you read is going to say just what I said, that the traditional view, now they won't say the traditional view is, they'll just say, this is how it happened. And the part is that people don't see the symmetry of God. People don't see this in the much bigger picture of, the, of what he's painting. And so even if you read commentaries about when they believe these things in the Old Testament happen, you've got to put on your, you know, your, you know, symmetry helmet. You've got to say, well, you know, they've always said, now if it says in the second month, then, you know, that's what it is. But if they say, well, you know, like Jesus' ministry, they say is three and a half years long. I'm saying it can't be. It just cannot be. It says that he came to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, I, I believe it was longer than a year because he was at a Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, we talked about, you know, his being in the Feast of Tabernacles um, and, you know, standing up in the middle of it. And so, you know, it was at the Tabernacles just before his acceptable year, the Tabernacles in his acceptable year. You know, you could, you could make a picture either way, but it certainly, his ministry was not longer than two years. But, you know, and I'm saying it's closer to the year than three and a half years because it's the symmetry of God. It's the prophecies of what is saying his ministry would be, the acceptable year of the Lord. And so you read things that commentaries all say this is the way it was. But, you know, you've got to put on in your minds uh, that uh, this just does not fit with the symmetry of God. Oh, there we go. Do we have any other questions? No. Okay. I have a I have a million of them. I just don't want to hog all the airtime. <laughs> well, does anybody else have any questions? Otherwise, I'll I'll ask one. Okay, go for it, Rob. Uh, Gary, how much stock do you put into the Nibiru thing? I'm 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 assuming you watched the link that Shane Height sent out a month or two ago. Yes. And this, this guy who put out the series, God's Roadmap to the End. Yes. And he's quite specific on things he says are going to happen. And right. Well, and, and he, he makes very good points. Because one of the things, you know, two of the things I never thought of was, one, the prophecy of the Old Testament where it says, uh, you know, talking to the adversary, it says, you will bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head. And that the picture of the comet, when the comet hit, Jeru hit Jupiter, Jupiter is the king planet, and the picture was this comet hit Jupiter in the bottom portion of Jupiter, which we, you would call the heel of the planet, when it completely destroyed this comet. So it just, you know, destroyed the head of the comet. The comet was completely destroyed. And so it was a picture of that, you know, you will bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And so when he said that, I thought, oh, my gosh. You know, I mean, is, is even the heavens giving us the pictures of these prophetic events? And so I, and as soon as he said that, I thought, all right, now there's much more going on here than we have ever allowed in our minds to believe. So I will say this, it definitely opened up my eyes. Now, do I think it's going to happen exactly what, as he said? I can't say that, but I will say this, I am definitely looking at it in a whole new light. And so very interesting, you know, pictures of what's going on. One thing that caught my attention and, and that fits was something that caused the three hours of darkness from noon to three on the day Christ was crucified. Right. And that, I don't know, but that just fits that something caused a three hour eclipse. And You know, we've always taken it as phenomena. Yeah. But, you know, this star sign of Revelation chapter 12 verses one and two, we've always taken as, you know, figurative. So yes, could all this be much more literal than we've ever imagined in our lives? And yes, I mean, it very well could be. So this, yeah, he makes very good points with all that. So I, there's no way to discount it. I mean, you just got to look at that and go, wow, I had never seen that before. Is it going to be the way it's going to happen? I'm not sure. But man, that is definitely amazing food for thought. Thanks. Uh, Thank Dave you. Carroll has their hand up. Can I throw one real quick real thing? Quick. 
that comet that you mentioned, the name of that comet was Shoemaker. Yes, yes, yeah. which also refers to heels. Somebody who makes shoes. Now, was the guy's name Shoemaker and Levi? Were the, Levi were the two guys who discovered it. But yes, that is even a more interesting point. It's all about shoes and heels. <laughs> all right, Dave. Yeah, my question was concerning the the ministry of Jesus. Was, didn't the sacrificial lamb have to be of the first year? It all points to you know of the flock, so it had to be a guy. Of you know the flock of Israel without spot or blemish, one year old. I mean, all that just that's the symmetry I'm talking about. And where they say it was, you know, three and a half years, I just it can't can't be. It just can't be. Right. Uh Lisa had a question. It was the question was with regard to your what you were talking about about uh the the Revelation twelve sign being taken figuratively. Is that, John and I were talking about that yesterday and our understanding about that, the, according to the best of our memory, like with regard to what the way ministry taught was that they, they taught that it was an actual star sign, but that it had to do with the past, not that it was prophetic of the future, that it had to do with the time of Jesus's birth. When you say, when you talk about it being taken figuratively rather than literally do you mean mainstream christianity views it that way it's like if you read in the commentaries and yes. stuff yes yeah if you read in the commentaries like um bollinger's commentary he takes it back to the time of joseph when joseph had those dreams about the everybody bowing down and the 12 stars and the sun and the moon he goes well this obviously is a picture of that you know, because it talks about, you know, crown of 12 stars and the sun and the moon and all that. And so, yes, they all meant it to be figuratively. So That's interesting, though, that he, he figured out that it was Virgo, but then, he, then some un misunderstanding happened from there. But um... Well, and as I said, the misunderstanding is no one thought a constellation could have got pregnant. No one thought a constellation could have a crown of 12 stars and all that. So, but until we've realized it literally is going to happen, it's opened up a whole new plane for us. It's kind of funny how people make assumptions like that. You know, God said that the, the, all the, the, the things in the heavens were for signs and that type of thing. So it's kind of interesting that they thought that instead of thinking, well, there, you know, it says that this is going to happen in the heavens. So, I don't really understand exactly what this means yet, but it must really going to be happening in the heavens. Well, part of it is the fact that Daniel gave us the heads up that the stuff was going to be hidden until knowledge increased. And this was part of it until we got the picture that this was actually going to happen in the heavens. We, none of us would have put this together. I mean, the way it's coming together now, none of us would have had a clue until we get to the time when actually we see in the future that this is actually going to happen. So until oh, that, we've got the knowledge like we have now, we couldn't have possibly put all this together. Yeah, so you're kind of, I'm seeing now the connection, what you're saying about where it talks about knowledge being increased in the, in time, in the last days and that the things were going to be hidden. So when the knowledge was increased with the technology that we have and stuff now with, the, with these astronomical programs and stuff, then that's what, what apparently that was what was being prophesied about. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, Andy's got his hand up. Well, let's do let's do one more question because I I have a uh, we're having a birthday party here at our house today, so I need to. Mine's more of a comment than a question, but you you know feel free to. As I was watching your video yesterday, and then in the in the right hand side on YouTube, you know, there's all these other ones talking about the same thing. Yes, it hit me that God wants all men to be saved. He's not hiding this from us. He no. wants us to declare this. He wants us to warn everyone. And some people are like Thomas, that unless they can actually see it and touch it, you know, and so we can use these things as great witnessing tools. And it, it really hit my heart that, wow, God is, is one last time reaching out to humanity and saying, look, look up, straighten your back and look up and see the day of your redemption draws near. 
Well, and I believe it's never been easier to witness than these days when one, there's so much trouble in the world, just like the Bible predicted. And two, you know, you could discount that the Bible was just written by some guys who got together and had a few beers. <laughs> but, but you look up in the heavens and you go, you know what? This was written about a long time ago. And you cannot, you cannot, uh, you know, you couldn't make this stuff up. The detail that this was written about, some of these things that are happening in the heavens, you just could not have planned this. And it's just, it's just a bigger picture of the big picture. And so, yes, it's very easy to, to talk with somebody and say, wow, you know, all this stuff, isn't it crazy going on? Let me tell you about what God's up to. And they give the heavens and talk about the stories that have, you know, what's going on above us. And it's just amazing. Well, thank you, Gary, so much for, for sharing both last weekend and this morning. Uh, we really appreciate it and look forward to more.